Welcome back to Chapter 3 for Physics 125 at GRCC. This lecture video is going to discuss projectile motion and link back to our understanding from the Chapter 2 um, one-dimensional kinematics problems that we were solving. Most of this particular video is going to be uh, going through what examples we will have separate videos for. There are many different example problems for projectile motion because they are one of our core problem types out of Chapter 3. Vector addition and projectile motion problems are really the two problem types to come out of this chapter. So the pieces of information that we've seen in previous lectures that we're using now are the idea of kinematics, which we had introduced in Chapter 2 and we've been using. So on the left, we have all of the equations for horizontal motion that we started Chapter 2 with. And on the right, we have the equations for vertical motion, which we saw in Section 2.7 of the chapter. We also went through trigonometry in our first lecture video for Chapter 3. And we went through all of the core ideas that we were going to be using and have started to see those pieces of trigonometry be used. Two of the most important ideas are that if we have a vector at an angle, we break it up into components using sine and cosine. And if we are doing vector addition, we will have to use the ideas of trigonometry to build our final answer for our sum vector using the Pythagorean theorem and the idea of tangent and inverse tangent. We saw in the slides one fully worked example of vector addition, and we have a separate um, example video with a full vector addition example gone through on the light board. And you can always return to those or talk through um, additional examples in office hours to make sure that we understand the steps that we take. You break the vector into components, you add the components, and then you find the size and the angle of the total vector using the trigonometry pieces that we introduced in this chapter. Okay, so that's where we have left off. That's kind of the foundational understanding that we need to go into the next um, section of this book here, which is projectile motion. Now, when an object moves two-dimensionally, so it moves in the x and y directions at the same time, we handle all of the horizontal motion with an x equation, and we handle all of the vertical motion with a y equation. We've already been separately using the x equations and y equations, and so the only difference here is we just need to be more careful to keep all of the x parts and the y parts separate from each other in the problem. The process that we use to go through problem solving, those same six steps of drawing the picture, listing the information that we have, rephrasing the question, all of that is still used here in Chapter 3 because it's a very similar um, physics topic. It's still kinematics, it's just kinematics in two dimensions. In the problems that we'll see in this course, all throughout our semester, we are going to see that the X and Y motions are independent of each other. The reason I specify Physics 125 is there are situations in Physics 126 with electric fields and magnetic fields where X and Y pieces kind of interact with each other, but every single thing we do in this course, anything that happens in X can only affect things in the X equations, and anything that happens in Y can really only affect things in the Y equations. We're going to make sure we understand why this is so helpful for us because it means that we can use the exact same tools that we were using in Chapter 2. This is a um, set of images together, uh, basically a strobe light flashing different colors on a cart as it moves, showing snapshots of a ball's motion that was shot straight upwards as the cart moved. But because the cart was moving, both the ball and the cart have the same horizontal um, speed. And the only difference is the vertical speed of the um, ball. That it moves upwards, it pauses in the upward direction, and then comes back down. But that entire time, it still moves horizontally in the same way as the cart. There is a video on YouTube that you can click through if you're interested. It won't be put into our playlist that shows this. 
Um, but what we also want to recognize is that there's plenty of demonstrations that show this as well. So at the top of this slide is a link to another demonstration called the shoot and drop, which we also do in class normally, but we're not in class. And so we're, we're going to rely on already existing recorded demonstrations. And this, um, this animation on our slide actually shows the same general situation. It's just that we tend to, as human beings, trust um, full demonstrations that we can see instead of just animations that show the same thing. But I want to talk us through what it's trying to show us. There's some grid paper in the um, kind of background of this animation. And the red ball on the left is just dropped. And the blue ball on the right has an initial sideways velocity. It does not have an initial up or down velocity. And so the vertical motion has the same starting situation. They both have no initial vertical velocity, which means they fall at the same rate. And you can check that by seeing how many grid boxes they pass through. But they do move differently when we're looking at the side to side direction. But this is showing us a little bit about the independence of motion. And again, the link on our slide here is clickable and it will bring us to a video of the same kind of demonstration that we're animating here. Now, in projectile motion problems, we will always have the constant downward acceleration of gravity, and that is the only acceleration that we'll have in the problem. There is no air resistance acting in our Physics 125 problems. There is no speeding up or slowing down as in the sideways direction once we have stopped touching the object, whether we threw it or kicked it or whatnot. So I want us to think about then what that means for our accelerations. For gravity, how were we using gravity in chapter two? What sign did it have, plus or minus? And was that in the y direction or the x direction as we represented it in chapter two? Hopefully we answered both of these questions and we answered them correctly. Gravity, in the way that we set up our problems, we choose up to be positive and down to be negative, which means it has a negative sign. And because it's an up and down motion and not a side to side motion, it is in the Y direction. And so on our slide here, we have the official accelerations for all of projectile motion. We won't ever be asking in this section of the chapter, we won't ever be asking for an acceleration because it's always going to be these two for the problems that we ask about in Physics 125. Now, what's really, really important to recognize is that if we throw things sideways, if our initial throw is sideways, that is not a vector at an angle it is already a single component. A lot of students kind of psych themselves out or try to overthink the problem somehow and make all sorts of complicated setups for themselves when we have sideways initial motion, when really mathematically these are simpler than when we are throwing at an angle initially. So I want to point out right away that this is a common situation, and in fact it's really common to show up on homework and tests because the math is simpler, but the physics is in a lot of ways tougher if we don't understand why we break vectors into components and why it only happens when it's at an angle. If we throw it sideways, then the vertical piece is already zero. There is no up or down part of a sideways arrow and the sideways arrow is already the horizontal piece, the initial x velocity. We will also see plenty of situations where we are um, starting an object moving initially at an angle, and then there is a horizontal piece and a vertical piece. So all of the horizontal pieces here are color-coded blue. We might notice that those blue arrows stay exactly the same length every time because there is no horizontal acceleration. And the initial vertical velocity is color-coded orange here. We do see how that arrow changes drastically throughout the problem. It is initially large and pointing upwards. It gets smaller and smaller until at the peak of the motion, the vertical part, 
is gone, but we're still moving sideways. And then it gets bigger and bigger in the downward direction. It is speeding up in the downward direction. The other really, really important thing to keep in mind, and we mentioned this in chapter two, but it continues to be important in chapter three, is when we hit the ground in our physics problems, we are still moving very quickly. That's why we have an additional arrow that shows, basically, if we continued that motion after hitting the ground, we're still moving faster and faster. This is something that we hopefully have in all capital letters and highlighted from chapter two, that in our physics problems, when the object reaches the ground, it is not moving with a zero velocity. It does have speed, it does have motion. The velocity is not zero at the ground. Okay. So here are the same equations that we started this lecture video with. The x equations on the left, the y equations on the right. The only difference that I have made in putting them on this slide is I have put x and y subscripts all throughout the problem every time that there's a v or an a. Because there is a vx, a vy, an ax, which is zero, and an ay, which is negative g. Okay. So the first step is if we plug in the accelerations we know that projectile motion has, these simplify a little bit. A lot of terms on the left go to zero, and a lot of terms on the right now look very similar to what we've been using, but we've built in the negative sign, and we've called it negative g instead of a generic acceleration a. So if we simplify these terms and get rid of the ones that have gone to zero, we also want to recognize that in the x set of equations, the very bottom equation becomes vx squared equals v initial x squared, which is identical in meaning to vx equals v initial x. And so those two don't both need to be in the equation. So this is where we get to when we do those simplifications. Now, as a reminder, some of the assumptions that we've made are that there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction, that gravity is downwards and we've forced that to become negative, and that you can only use the x equations for horizontal motion and you can only use the y equations for vertical motion. And then just like in chapter two, we've set our initial starting time to be zero seconds so that what we're doing is we're watching a situation having just started a stopwatch as soon as we start looking at it. The only thing that we've really done with the equations on that previous slide compared to the equations we've been using in chapter two is we've created a slightly more specific set of circumstances. It's kind of like using a very specialized hammer for a particular task, but it's still functionally something you use in the same situations. The toolkit that we have from chapter two, hammer and screwdriver and drill and all these things, it's the same exact tools here in chapter three. They're just slightly more specified. What we're going to see for the rest of these slides is introducing several different example problems that each have their own video and then ending with a discussion of a um, important and useful demonstration that is often used for this topic in physics. All right. So example 3a was in the previous portion when we were talking about vector addition. Example 3b here is our first official projectile motion problem. We have a soccer ball on the ground, and we want to find out what happens when it hits the ground again. We'll go through the um, problem solving process just like we did in chapter two. As a reminder, the reason we're not seeing it here in this lecture video is it has its own lecture video to go through. Example 3C, this is one of those situations, one of many, where we are moving initially directly sideways. And so there is less math set up for us, but we have to recognize what that means for our physics understanding and make sure we know how to label that three meters per second when we're making a list of our known information. So we'll see that example in its own video. 
This example is one of my favorites to do in class because we actually um, have this dart launcher. It's um, a fly swatter, but it launches like this little webbed thing. It's quite fun. And so normally this is an in-class demonstration where we physically shoot the dart or bug launcher um, fly swatter thing and see how far it goes from the starting point horizontally to figure out how fast that thing is actually launching um, with a spring, this small uh, fly swatter. So for this example, in order for us to have our own separate um, example video, let's say that it goes 3.4 meters and we'll use that in our problem solving. Example 3E has several different parts so that we can fully consider many different questions we can ask about a projectile motion problem. So for example, 3E, we're at the top of a building and we throw up at an angle. In example 3F, we're at a top of a building and we throw down at an angle. And we're gonna be able to compare basically, directly compare what sticking points show up in those two separate examples. This is another one where we are starting at the ground and launching at an angle. But in this example, the reason why it's different and useful for us to see is because it's a totally different question for us to answer. We want to know if we make it above a wall that we know how far away that wall is and we know how tall that wall is. So we'll walk through what this question is really asking and how we use our problem solving process to solve it. There are some hints here on the slide, but we'll go through all of that in the lecture video or the example video separate from this lecture video. And then the last full projectile motion example problem is one that has much messier algebra than the rest of the examples. We do this problem so that we can see just how versatile our toolkit is, but it is important for us to recognize that problems that have extra messy algebra aren't really the ones that we pick for test situations because for tests, we really are just trying to see if we understand the physics that we are learning, the new skills of physics. And we don't want to make it um, kind of uh, confused with all of these algebra skills that we may be very comfortable with or we may be not so comfortable with but are using to do our problem solving. So this example, while it can absolutely show up on homeworks and we will see a fully worked example video for it, it is not the kind of problem that shows up on tests. And so the last couple of slides, I just want to end the chapter with a mention of a very common story slash demonstration that happens in um, physics departments uh, called the monkey and the hunter. So the idea is there's a monkey in a tree and a hunter aiming at it. And the hunter aims, let's say a tranquilizer dart directly at the monkey. Okay, he's completely forgotten about gravity, so he's just very excited to find a monkey to study. And the monkey, in order to try to evade capture, lets go of the branch he's on immediately as the hunter fires the dart. Now, what we want to talk through and then see in a couple of um, recorded demonstrations is that by dropping as soon as the dart is launched, the monkey has actually sealed its own fate. It should have just stayed in the tree. So let's think about why that is. Okay, let's put ourselves in a situation where there just isn't any gravity. If that monkey let go of the branch, then he wouldn't drop anywhere. And the hunter aiming directly at the monkey was the right thing to do because there's no gravity to have to have forgotten about. If that's the case, then the dart's gonna follow the dashed line directly to the target and hit it and everyone except for the monkey will be happy. If we add in gravity then, the dart will fall with an added term of one half GT squared and the monkey will fall with an added term of one half GT squared. So what that means is no matter how long it takes for the dart to reach the monkey as the monkey's falling, they will hit each other at the same spot because gravity's acting on them both in the same way. So no matter how fast or slow the dart is, as long as it gets to the monkey before the monkey hits the ground, it will hit the target. So 
You don't need to take my word for it and just look at these sketches. We've got two separate videos that each have their own merits in terms of entertainment value, but also camera shots and slow motion and additional um, content um, that show this demonstration. I think they're both pretty cool. So they'll be at the end of the chapter three um, set of videos after all of the example problems. Uh, but it is one way to kind of make some of the connections between what we started this lecture video with, the independence of X and Y motion, and what that really means for a variety of situations. So I will see you, or you will hear me, in several different example videos for the chapter um, three projectile motion problems. And then we will be moving on to chapter four. See you then.